So I'm joined today by Steve Horton, owner of Bakersfield and Flower out in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Thanks for being here, Steve. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And by the way, this is a, um, a very special episode because it's actually the first one that we're doing with video. So oh. thanks for participating. Oh. Wow. She told me I had my hair done. Yeah. Just... I did brush my hair. Oh, but good. That's about it. <laughs> Um, yeah, so for, for anyone who's listening um, to this, and if you want to watch it, you can just head over to our YouTube channel, which is Sustainability Matters Today. Um, but Steve, Happy New Year. It's, uh, we're at the very beginning of January. Yeah, it's a, it's a change for us. We're just off coming off a pretty busy December. Uh, you know, really, we're focused on, since we mill our own flour and make our own bread, yeah. and some pastry items, um, you know, December was for obvious reasons, quite busy. Yeah, you know, I bet that's um, both good and bad. Good because- Yeah, yeah it's all good. It just, everyone's kind of, you know, just recovering now. We're just yeah. back in sync, just about. The very first thing I, I want to say um, is that I, I don't know many bakers, but I have certainly never heard of bread being described as uh, that you can you can savor bread or grain like chocolate or wine. Absolutely, yeah. We and, we believe it. You know, we we uh, we uh, prescribe to that that notion that that uh, the levels and uh, the nuances that are in bread and in grain specifically just need to be developed within your palate. Um, and and we're still working on that, of course. But uh, we feel it, it's akin to chocolate or wine in terms of how how it how do we, how we think about it. Yeah, it's, it's incredible because you, you write on your website that you basically explore the local sources and, and in terms of highlighting the terroir of yes. different farms and grain varietals. Um, so your whole thing is about focusing on the grains of the upper Midwest, which is basically near Minneapolis and Minnesota. Um, exactly. We're, we're, our, our original goal was to be as Minnesota focused as we could. Yeah. Numerous reasons. Part of it being, uh, we, we felt like Minnesota grains in it is is overlooked in a way. Because mm -hmm. a lot of the, especially spring wheats, winter wheats are grown um, in Kansas, Oklahoma. You know, it, it, but the Dakotas, Minnesota, even into Wisconsin, there's there's still quite a bit of, of grain grown, and we wanted to highlight that as much as we could. So that's our focus. Partly coming back to sustainability as well as the number of food miles we're putting on True. that grain. So. You know, we've had a lot of people reach out to us from Nebraska and Kansas who would love to sell us grain, but it's, it's, while I'm sure the quality is great, it, it's, it's a little bit against what we're trying to, to achieve here. So, yeah, that makes sense. You just have your set values and you're sticking to them. Right. right? It, it's sometimes difficult because it's, it's difficult sometimes to get everything that we'd like to get, mm. um, the, uh, the quality in, in some cases. So. Um, so we have to make choices based on that. Makes sense. Yeah. Well, kind of pros and cons of every decision you make. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so can you actually, I'm, I'm just so curious because I've heard of wine connoisseurs being able to taste the terroir and being able to taste different grapes and all of that. So like, can you actually taste the difference between grains? If you, have you done like a blind taste test and actually tried? I, I haven't done blind, but what we do is, is, um, when we get a grain in and we're figuring out, first we, we want to figure out how it tastes, but we also want to know what its functionality is. So many bakers will look at protein percentages in flour, for example, as mm -hmm. a, sometimes it's a starting and ending point for people, but for us it's just a starting point because protein percentage can be indicative of the strength or weakness of the flour. So when I think of strength and weakness, I think of elasticity and extensibility, and there's a kind of a continuum there. Um, and so we want to look at what's the functionality of that, of that particular grain. How will it hold up in mixing? How will it hold up in fermentation? And what kind of product generally is it geared more towards? So as an example, uh, we have a spring wheat that we use, a hard red spring wheat called Bowles. It's just the name of it. Um, and it has a high protein percentage. It also behaves like what you would expect a high protein percentage grain to behave as, which is it creates a lot of elasticity, creates a lot of volume, um, and has um, great mixing and fermentation tolerance. So that means it's just going to hold up really well throughout the whole process. And what's that good for in terms of the type of bread you can make with sure. it? Well, we, we do make some pan breads. We make a brioche and then we Ooh. also make a, a everyday kind of sandwich loaf. 
and mm -hmm. hammer guns. Uh, and oh, I see. Kind of poofy, springy. Yeah, a little more airy, a little, you know, you're looking for something with a little bit of a pop to it. And yeah. this particular grain works really well for that. Now, on the downside is I don't actually think it tastes like much. It has yeah. it has almost an emptiness to it. Um, there's there's definitely terroir there, and, and it has a little bit of nuance. But when I compare that to, say, for example, a grain that we have had in the past that we're trying to get back in this next year is Linkert. Um, it's another hard red spring wheat, but there's a, just a much different level of flavor there in terms of there's some nuttiness, there's a, a complexity that stays and kind of really hangs around in your mouth. Like when you eat a really great piece of chocolate or even anything that has some, some real depth to it, it yeah. stays mouth you know what i mean it lingers and lingers and that's what some of the, what we're talking about with it be the earthiness or nuttiness those things those aspects of flavor really remain in your mouth and in the bowls it's a one note and it's gone um, I see. so we we tend to highlight that with maybe a little bit of fat like butter we put in the bread mm. or so it's bringing out some other flavors in addition to the natural leavening which is the sour of what we do trying to bring those flavors for it as well yeah. so that's kind of where we start. We look at it, how does it taste? How is it? How does it perform? What's the best use for it? And then we'll do a comparison with a different grain and see which one we, you know what works best for what we're trying to achieve. So to answer your question, long answer, uh, I, I can't do a blind taste test probably, but I can do them side by side and tell you what I'm tasting and what the differences are and why we choose one over the other. So we're still developing that. I mean. There are hundreds and hundreds of spring wheats and winter wheats out there, and we've just scratched the surface. We've yeah. used so far. So, um, Speaking of hundreds of hundreds of wheat, I've, I've, or varieties, I've, I recently discovered that in India, there's, uh, there used to be like over 1 million different varieties of rice. And each one has its own unique flavor profile and it can be it's probably similar it has different protein and starch percentages and so it, it's sure. good for certain things and yeah. so hundreds and hundreds of if you think about that um hundreds of hundreds of wheat varieties it makes a lot of sense there's nothing i mean in nature there's so many different kinds of varieties of everything you can't just have one of the same thing do, so do you ever um travel around the country tasting the bread of other bakers and kind of sit there and close your eyes and i have one before we opened um yeah. it, it been open for about three and a half years and prior to that i traveled to north carolina and to vermont um and both places had mill bakeries um okay. so you could pick their brains in terms of because at that point i had no milling knowledge at all mm. um and we, it's been quite a learning curve over those three and a half years but really to start to learn what it meant to mill your own flour in the yeah. environment where you're baking. And these were predominantly bakers who learned how to mill as well. And so I learned like how they approached what they did and, and what their bread tasted like and you know be it commercially yeasted or naturally leavened or however they were going about their business. Um, and it's very much very regional here. Um, you know what what grows well here does not necessarily grow well in Vermont. Um, it yeah. may may not. Um, it, you know, even though there's our, our growing seasons and climate is somewhat similar, but mm. uh, California, for example, is much different than here in terms of what the growing season looks like, in terms, you know, the temperature extremes and everything else. So the grains that do well here are not so the ones that do well there as well, so, as an example. So I have done some of that. Um, the gentleman that built our mill, uh, Andrew Hain, who's located in Vermont, has a company called Elmore Mountain, and they're bakers um, and millers, but he also builds mills. Right. And at the time, the mill he built for us was the largest one he had built. Um, that was just relevant because he still, he works on a smaller scale. Like most of the mills he builds are roughly 30 to 48 inch stones. Mm -hmm. So as far as one, you know, the diameter, um, a bed stone and a runner stone. And so we have a stone mill uh, system that we employ. Um, and then we also do a, a sifting system using pneumatics, which is air tubes to move the flour from whole grain status into a sifter because we do sift uh, about 60% of the flour that we mill, which is bolted or sifted flours, which you would buy in many grocery stores um, in the U.S. at least as well, where a lot of that flour has been stripped down of the germ and the bran in order to create uh, shelf life and stability. 
but by doing so, you've eliminated most of the nutrients um, and a lot of the flavor aspects of it, because most of those fats and nutrients and minerals are all in those in the germ. And so when we sift, we the way we screen out our flour, we try to hold back as much of the germ and some of the bran as we can. So a typical oh, industrial flour is about 70% extraction of the grain, and ours is about 83 to 85%, roughly. Mm -hmm. you know, a little bit on the grain but um and so what we're trying to do there is bring that in and, and that's where we get the difference in terms of ash content and the overall kind of creaminess of the of the flour in terms of how it looks got it compared to a whiter flour so so that's um that's why you've gone through the whole ordeal of actually having a mill at your bakery right exactly that was that was the biggest aspect when i i had a bakery before um, a few years ago that i sold and one of the interesting things about Minneapolis was it was at one point the largest um, flour production facilities or was the largest producing uh, city in the, in the world for flour. Um, but Hence that's the name that, Mill City. Exactly. Yeah. It's the name Mill City. But over the early 20th century, slowly that moved mainly for transportation purposes, reasons to the eastern part of the U.S. with the Great Lakes and, and, and um, distribution point from there. And while it was still relevant here, over the decades in the latter part of the 20th century, more and more, we, there's very few, there are very few operating mills in this area anymore of, mm. of any size. They've all moved to the population centers because it's a lot cheaper to ship the grain, mill the flour near the population center than it is to do it the other way around. Um, and so because of that, though, we, we ended up with, um, you know, an interesting kind of, I wouldn't say void, but we're, we're very locked in in terms of what flour we're able to get. So we have a few big, big companies, multinational, uh, General Mills, Cargill, Bay State. They are the three big ones that we can buy flour from if you're a local baker through a distributor. Well, that limits you to four or five bread flours, for example. And that's great, except everybody's using the same flour. And so the, the kind of what is your main base, that's what you do everything with. So how do you, how do you differentiate yourself? How do you explore and kind of go with that next step? And that was my idea is kind of go backwards, which many people around the country are doing in a very similar way. Um, how do we how do we do that? So that's that's kind of what started the whole process for us. Right, and that that what that's what basically gives you the control of the percentages that you mentioned. Yes. And yeah. the freshest. Well, I mean, if you're milling the flour and, and you're actually basically creating the flour right there, and then you're baking with it a couple mm -hmm. hours later. I can't imagine flour that's any fresher than that. Right, exactly. That's our goal. When we, we try to mill and then use the flour the next day, that's kind of our, most, mostly because of production. Because yeah. okay. We have to follow into an efficiency. But when we have a accounts order flour, so we sell to restaurants and then we, we bag retail bags as well. When, once an order is placed, our goal is to get that to them within 48 hours. So the idea is again, freshness, yes. And that highlights, as flour sits, what happens is over time it oxidizes. Mm -hmm. So oxygen binds with it and starts to eliminate a lot of those lipids, those fats go away in a sense. And, and that's where a lot of that flavor component, you know, goes yeah. away well, as, as well as the nutrients. Now, there is a downside to fresh flour from a production standpoint is because green or, or fresh flour tends to be a little bit more difficult to work with because it takes more hydration usually. Uh, it does not get the same type of volume as a uh, aged flour, or indu even not so much industrial, but an aged flour that's oxidized because I won't go into all the rabbit hole of it. But anyway, that, that's what happens. You have to adjust your process and your system oh, to maximize what you can do. Yeah. Um, it's not, it's not an enormous difference, but if you pay attention, I'd say you get a 10, 15% reduction in overall volume. If I were to do a side-by-side -side mix, ferment, bake, the whole process uh, using a, an aged flour and a fresh flour. So does that mean you need to just use more uh, flour to make the same? Well, we, in our situation, we would use more water. So we, okay. we use what's called, in baking, a lot of professional bakers use a baker's percent, which is baker's math. And so everything is based on flour. It's our, it's, since it is our primary ingredient, it's yeah. also the basis for everything. So that's your 100% point. So anything that varies from there, so water is an example. Let's say you had a recipe and it was 75% water. Um, so in, in a, you had 10 kilos of flour, it would be 7.5 kilos of water. Mm. So everything is based on flour. It all comes back. You have a total recipe 
you have your pre-ferments and then wow. final but anyway i won't go into all of that detail but so all of those factors in and what you generally will end up doing in fresh with fresh flowers adding a little bit more water i would say three to five percent roughly to make that dough perform the same way yeah uh, in terms of overall you know uh, consistency and and um and mm. uh, lift to some degree so the the mill that you use and you kind of touched on it that it's um that it's stone milled yeah what what is so special about stone and specifically granite i mean what's are there different kinds of mills that are stone yeah yeah all so mills are really just a tool and and there's a certain romance to stone milling because of course for centuries yeah. that's what everyone did um and what we like about the stone mill for our purpose is that we are whole grain focused so many of our breads are 100 percent whole grain or mm. whole grain um and, and for us doing a single pass um, in terms of this, the grain goes through the hopper and down into the stones and then mills out. And so with stone milling, you have three primary functions that are occurring. You have a compression that happens, you have a shearing, and then you have abrasion, which occurs over the surface of the stone. Um, and the four variables to control the type of flour you're getting is one, the stone, stone size, which is already set at this point, the speed of the stones, how fast you feed the grain, and then the gap between the runner and the bedstone. So those four variables, three really variables, one set, yeah. are the what determine what type of flour you get from the particular type of grain. So we have different types of um, uh, parameters that we use for each type of grain that we have, and then we have to adjust it based on time of year or once we redress the stones. Um, and the reason we use granite is uh, composite stones can work well too, but we've found for what we're trying to achieve that uh, the, the granite, I think, is a little bit more functional. Mm. Uh, some of the larger stone mills that are built do use composite stones, so it's not, and then part of that is, is functionality, part of it is cost, I think, um, at least from our perspective, you know. We found it, uh, it worked out really well for our purposes, but yeah. you have to continue to redress the stone. So it really depends on use. Like right now, about every two to three months, we're taking the mill apart. We have a crane that basically sits above the mill all the time and lifts up the one stone. We redress it with a stone cutter to rough it up, in a sense. Oh, I see. And that compression, shearing, and all of those elements to make the, the grain consistent piece of, make it into consistent flour. Yeah. Uh, so those, those are kind of all of that, the, the, the reasons why. But from a stone milling standpoint, we find that stone mills work well for whole grain flour. So traditionally roller milling, when it when whole grain flour is produced off of a roller mill, it's all broken out into multiple uh, pieces and then put back together. And so what ends up happening is all of those different components are, are milled to different consistencies. So when you put that all back together, it's not the same consistency. And for a baker, it's, it's a lot easier to produce consistent bread if your flour particles are pretty much even. Yeah. Uh, there's a variance, of course, but when you talk about one versus the other, it made more sense for us to go this route. So that was part of the consideration. Another was cost, frankly, uh, for what we were trying to do in the infrastructure we need to put in place. This worked really well for what we were trying to achieve. So um, I think it really is tools are important, but it's how you use the tool. Because we could use a roller mill and still try to achieve what we're doing, which is be a different way of going about it. Got it. That's... Um... Yeah, it's probably a lot too more too much information. I don't know. But I ha I mean I have absolutely no background in in how the I see when I, I go to the store I see bread and I just think yeah. wow some some of it's delicious some of it's not not so much but yeah. it's interesting that I mean it's obviously a science and an art and it's wonderful right. to hear the hear it all. Um, when I when I first heard or read that you use a stone mill, I mean the first thing I thought of is a, a big windmill. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Our yeah. Horses. Yeah. It's interesting you mentioned India earlier. In India, there are many many small little mills that are based in neighborhoods, and people bring their grain to these mills. They mill the flour, then they take it home. And India tends to be hot, right? It's from a temperature standpoint. Yeah. So these mills run. They run very very fast. Because, of course, in order to make this work, they need to be milling the flour fairly quickly. So they're producing flour that's quite hot. Hmm. And there's been some, some initial research into, because anecdotally, there's a lot of people that think that hot flour means that this, the, the, the nutrients start to degrade, that the flour itself is not as ideal as if it were milled at a cooler temperature. Um, but 
a lot of cases it hasn't been as relevant in India because they use the flower right away and sit around, you know. So, yeah. but it, it's interesting because there's a there's a huge kind of history of stone milling there um, versus kind of went away for us in a while. For the, in this country, at least, we we really went away from it. Um, and there are a lot of areas that have derelict, you know, buildings or even just stone mm. stones around. But now in the last I'd say 10 years, especially, there's been a kind of a, almost a revival, and there are, I am, I'm not even sure, probably 40 to 50 uh, operations that are similar in scope of what we're doing in terms of, you know, milling and baking or farming and milling, and uh, most of them are using stone mills. Uh, a lot of it has to do with, you know, uh, ease of use, longevity, all of those type of things. So. Yeah, but it makes sense. I mean, I think there's a lot of it's kind of there's always the counterculture when yeah. things start leaning too far in one direction then it starts kind of going like vinyl is now coming is, is becoming cool again and right. uh stone milling is I'm, I'm guessing similar because like you were saying you have these big corporations that all make the same exact flour um and you know there are, there are people who just like with micro brewing as well with beer i would imagine it's similar with with bread and any other food or drink product really it's like you'd want to try the local the micro it's like micro bread almost micro micro baking right exactly and that's that is our perspective we feel like you know that is our perspective and we're a little bit ahead of our our market here in the twin cities mm -hmm. no one else is doing that there's one small mill here about our size a little smaller but they don't bake they sell their flour um and there's some smaller regional mills that are bigger than we are but for the most part in this in this area Nobody else is doing this. You have to go all the way to Madison, which is about four and a half, five hours to find somebody doing it. Um, or right. Chicago, you know, which is six or seven hours away. So there are people around the country doing it, but not really so much in this market. So we're we're having to tell our story um, a lot to yeah. people. And, and that's good, but it also sometimes doesn't resonate depending on the customer and their experience. Like, what do you mean you know your own flower? Like they, we just get this kind of, you know, glazed look from them. Sometimes we get a very much engaged, depending on the customer. Like they get it, they understand it, they want to know more. And th those are the people that tend to have a little bit more, um, you know, their identity tied to what they eat, where it's sourced, how it's sourced, all of those things. Yeah. I mean, I think a big part of why people don't even understand the, the glazed look um, yeah. it is I, I don't think people even realize what the process is. You know, they kind yeah, of know. People have no idea. What do you mean? You drain ground and then it's milled and then you know, it's cleaned and then it's sort of dehauled and cleaned and then milled and they made it. You know, what? Yeah. You know, they, they just I thought you just make bread. Exactly. Yeah. It's sliced. It's in a plastic bag. I take it home. Yeah. Exactly. A little bit of a difference. Yeah. So that that process in food in general is you know is depending on where you are. I feel, always feel like Minnesota is about five years behind the food trends that are happening on the east and west coast mm -hmm. here. Um, that's probably not true, but it feels sometimes like that when I go to the West or East Coast. Um, and I know a, a friend of mine who's a baker here is from California, and he's been here for seven, eight years. And he's just still always flummoxed by the fact that we can't sell our bread for this amount of money that they can sell out of California. So what we would sell for 4 or $5, they would sell for 7 or 8 um, wow. And just the difference in terms of customer expectations, um, you know, the, the, the frequency of purchasing, all of those things. I mean, Minnesota is unique. The Twin Cities is unique too because of the geography. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, you can fit all of London in our seven county area, but London's population is probably three times what we, I think the Metro is, I want to say it's about three and a half, four million people here. So it's very wow. spread out. And the core cities are, are denser, but they're not what you would call like a dense city. And so we have a, a geography challenge here as mm. well. Um, and so people's frequency of purchases is based on convenience more than anything else. This is my opinion. And, um, and so if they're going to make a choice and it's snowing between going to a bakery or going to the grocery store, which they're already going to. Yeah. So, I mean, that's just been my experience over 20 years, but it's, it's an interesting dilemma for us. So. Yeah, it's interesting and that kind of dovetails nicely into what exactly is local in that case because uh, i imagine local for you might be very different than what local means to someone in in london for example or in the uk where it's everything is just much closer together in yeah. general exactly i mean i i can't i 
it local to me in some ways, at least from a marketing standpoint, has become like the word natural. Yeah. Uh, and and even to some degree organic here at least mm-hmm. in the US. Um, and so I think of local more based on relationships. Um, and I think of it as what That's makes you know what makes sense in us really. You know, yeah. it doesn't really make sense for us to buy from Nebraska when it's you know, four hundred miles away. Yeah. Probably not a local thing anymore. You know, is it is a hard and fast rule? No, because we do buy some spelt, for example, from Michigan. Because Michigan is 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 the predominant area where most spelt in the U.S. Not all, but a large percentage of it is grown, de-hulled, and cleaned, and all that. Mm-hmm. So we do get some spelt that's from there. It's not really local. So you know, it, it becomes one of these things we have to weigh all the time in terms yeah. of what we have to achieve. But Primarily, it's about relationships, and it's about trying to build, uh, for us, a great economy. We're trying to learn from the large corporations uh, like General Mills and Cargill. They did a very good job of building an infrastructure that works really well for them, um, except that somebody like us, we can't exist in that type of, of uh, infrastructure because we're too small. Yeah. We can't buy enough grain. We can't store enough grain. We can't clean it in a way that fits anywhere on that scale. So we have to think about it in terms of how do we make it work. So as an example, I know you talked to Luke Peterson. Yeah. He's one of my favorite people. And he's, um, you talk about somebody who's totally all in, just put all your chips in and he's ready to go. Um, and he, he lives his, he lives his beliefs every day. Um, he, he grows about two and a half hours from us, roughly, uh, west, straight west. And his farm's there. Now his grain is, he grows it, he harvests it. Then what do we do with it? Um, we need to get it cleaned. Um, in order to mill it, we need to get it milled or cleaned to a pretty close to a food grade or to a food grade quality, I would say. Um, and so using elevator systems, which is what the larger you know, corporations do to bring grain in, store it, clean it, move it. It's not, it's not even, it's not functional for them or us. Because we would just, our grain from Luke would just get sorted in with other grain. It wouldn't oh, I see. It gets lost, yeah. Yeah, it would no longer be single line. So what we need to do is figure out how to clean it. So we've gone to seed houses, which operate on a much smaller level, um, and they will clean our grain and ship it to us. Now, we're still too small for most of those seed houses. They want to operate on a, for example, seven, 800 bushels is ideal for them, which is an entire semi-load. We can't store that much. That's about 20 pallets. I can hold 22 pallets in my in our space. So if I get an entire ship, uh, shipment and then one semi of one particular kind of grain, I now have almost no room left for any other grain. Hmm. So we need to be able to balance and have flexibility with the farmers that we work with in the cleaning system and the storage, all of that. So that's why I start to talk about how do we create a grain infrastructure, a grain economy yeah. that works for everybody. It has to work for the farmers first. Then where do we get these pieces and move this forward? So as an example, Luke's looking at putting cleaning equipment on his farm. He's purchased a lot of it. Oh wow! He would actually clean all of it. He would store it and then bag it and ship it to us. Now for him, he would capture all of those dollars because we pay him for grain, we pay a cleaner, we pay a shipping company, all of these different elements. But now if it all goes to Luke, then hopefully that helps. It's worth his while, you know. Absolutely. But these are all the factors that we're dealing with. Our biggest Challenge is storage. That's the biggest challenge. So, so he could actually store some of it for you. Yes, in some cases, some farmers have bins that they can store grain in, but it needs to be cleaned first to make right. sure it doesn't have um, uh, toxin levels. You know, we have to get the grain tested. There's two primary toxins that we're worried about: aflatoxin and monotoxin. And the USDA is concerned, and so they have to be below these certain minimums thresholds in order for it to be stable. So you can get it cleaned and take a lot of that out. Hmm. Um, cleaning system and then it's much more stable as long as it's kept in a... uh, so you, you mentioned the word sustainable in two different ways so far um, you've mentioned business sustainability which obviously is very important as you said if it doesn't work for the farmer um, mm-hmm. then it doesn't work at all and you're a business so from that point of view being having a sustainable business is important um, and it's it, I think it's a crucial part of environmental sustainability too which is mm-hmm. You know, if you're going to be environmentally friendly, it has to make sense from a financial standpoint, because unless you're a nonprofit and you can just keep fundraising, there's no way to to make it work, really. So um, I'm I'm curious to know, I mean, how does the how does that 
that work. You mentioned that, um, I think you said local was is similar to like natural now, um, but you, you still do use it for farm, um, for marketing rather. So it's an important part of the story. We do. Uh, so it, it, at least I think nationally it's true, but especially in this market, we have, we have a lot of restaurants that use um, the words local and they put their vendors on their, their menus example. And some of that is true. There is a definite commitment to some ingredients and products, but when you start to talk about local and a commitment, when you use a ingredient on a an menu item, and it's you know seasonal. That's great. I'm not dismissing it. But when I start to think about local, I, in order to move the needle for somebody like Luke, we need to be buying large percentages of what they produce. Yeah. Uh, and so to me, local is more than just I bought this ingredient or I occasionally buy these ingredients. It's a it's a commitment. It's a it's a level of saying, hey, we're we're in this. Um, and we have we have a lot of a lot of I would call it just lip service. You know, it looks great. Because people want to feel that they want to feel good, like on oh, supporting the local mm-hmm. initiative. In most cases, I don't. I feel like it's it, it rings a little hollow. So um, we have a couple of restaurants here that are that are very local. Like almost everything they buy is within a certain radius. And you know, there's not. I'm not necessarily saying better or worse. You know, that's for everyone else to just decide. But what I'm saying is, if you're going to say it's what you're doing, then it better be what you're doing. Yeah. Um, I mind. Um, otherwise, I just don't. I understand the marketing aspect of it. I just it's, it, it was a waste of energy and time for me. Yeah, so. I think so. That's the the whole issue of greenwashing, which is kind of the anti buzzword, I guess. Um, right. Just you know, saying that it's it's local, but you're kind of massaging it in order to make it fit. Right, right. So it you can. Good. Yeah, it looks good. You yeah. can raise your prices now because yeah. it fits the the term local, like you said, natural, uh, and. I think you're right with the word organic as well. It's kind of starting to lose that, the pureness yeah. of it. And that, actually, that's something Luke mentioned as well, um, that he thinks the word organic has basically lost its original meaning. And so he's using the word or the term regenerative, yeah. um, which I know you, you're you interested in as well. So I, And I know you have a, a few partners that you work with in terms of... Um, uh, you know, Luke being one of them, and there, there's a, a few other farmers where you source your grains. Um, so based on what Luke said, he has a very specific way that he farms, and it's it's pretty intense, especially if you compare it to the to the regular um, kind of the, the conventional farming. Right. Um, but I'm curious to know, I mean, do you actually check the farms? Do you go there? Do you meet with Luke? Or do you, how, how do you know that he's actually... That's a good question. I, I, I haven't visited all the farms. Uh, one of them is about five hours away. And I, frankly, I, I need to do that this year. That's one of the things that's on my list of... of 2020 uh, resolution. It, well, it's not even a resolution. It's a it's a commitment. We've got a lot of things on our plate that we're trying to achieve this year. But yeah. one of them is that. And I, um, I've, um, I, I, you know, I've, I've basically taken the word at it. And before it, um, I talk to them, I meet with them. Many, all of our farmers have been to the building multiple times. Mm-hmm. Um, many of the farmers actually deliver the grain themselves. Okay. Um, so we we have uh, uh, discussions. We we've had some panels of dis- uh, a couple years ago. There's a lady named Amy Holleran who um, is a big grain local grain proponent. She mm-hmm. lives in um, on the East Coast. Um, and she was here and she helped run a, a basically, a group was on it, a, a, a panel of people that were, in, um, you know, either growers and farmers, uh, processors, people in food. And we talked about what it means to have a grain economy, but um, we started, you know, we started to look at how things are grown, how they're processed. Yeah. So really, I've, I've taken their word at, for it. There isn't a regenerative certificate per se, there is an organic certificate. So I have all of that information. But as far as from no, I haven't. I haven't gone through it. The only actual direct evidence we have is uh, we the guy that owns our building. I was saying Kieran, who's involved, who also owns our business, is um, he contracted with a videographer and he went out and spent several days with Luke and filmed his his farm and his process. And so we have that video, which actually runs in a loop at the building all day long. Okay. Uh, yeah, and they're hoping to add other ones for the other brands as well at some point, but. So that's our only real like link to what he's doing, but mm. I don't have any sort of like, you know, 
or hard evidence. Yeah. yeah. But I think it sounds like you, you really find regenerative agriculture to be the way to do it based on what I've, what yeah, I've seen. I, I think so. I mean, for me, it's beyond organic. It's about soil health. Yeah. Uh, when we start to look at, there's been a lot of initiatives in Minnesota. We have a big erosion problem here. Um, so 98% of the grain, the wheat that's grown in Minnesota is spring wheat. So that means it's planted here in March, maybe April, harvested in August and September. So those fields are brown the rest of the year for the most part. And so what that means is it lends itself to a lot of erosion, a lot of soil loss. And soil health here is an issue, as it is in many, many areas around the world. Yeah. Um, but we've intensively farmed for so long using a lot of chemicals, be it pesticides or herbicides, that we've, we've really done a disservice to our soil and our water system. Um, and so to me, regenerative is, is the way, it, it, it not only is sustainable, it, it makes business sense. Because the long term, I, I just don't believe that science and chemicals is the way to go in the long run. Um, it, it's, it's a race to the bottom, basically. Yeah. So what Luke's trying to do in, in demonstrating success through that is, is to me where I hope farmers are starting to go. And, you know, the, the market's going to drive that, you know subsidies are going to drive that so That's it's true. a big discussion the farm bill if you want to get somebody going ask luke about the farm bill you can really, you can really he's looked at it he's broken it down and um you know the subsidies wow. go to the, the to the big guys really you know they don't they don't go to the small people like luke so yeah uh, but yeah that's where i do believe that the difference is in terms of agriculture because it's about soil health more than anything else mm -hmm. and that's created by all the things he talked about diversity crop rotations you know, um, livestock, crops, yeah. everything. Yeah. Yeah. That was one of the biggest things that, that Luke was talking about is that, um, basically the only way that he can continue growing in a regenerative style and the way that he does it and the way there are other farmers who do it is if people buy his product. Um, so actually you're one of the most important people, uh, in, in terms of, moving this kind of farming style forward because if if you don't buy it then he can't really continue growing it because the way he does it is more labor intensive so the, the cost is different it's not on par with what a big conventional farmer with thousands of acres would be able to get so um you're you're kind of a key player in fact, I would say you yeah, are the key. Are. It's, uh, you know, um, we, we, and that, that gravity of that hits me sometimes, you know, yeah. um, it's a great, it's a great position to be in, but it's also a lot of weight sometimes because the fact that I come back to what I talked about with our customers, for example, you know, um, if people are willing to spend $6 versus four or seven versus five, those dollars make a lot of difference in the long run because that means we can pay the people that are producing our primary ingredients um, a lot, you know, more money. Yeah. And that's the only way that this will continue to make sense for everyone. And, and so it's it's incumbent upon us to be able to be better marketers, which we have not been great at. That's by far our biggest weakness. Marketing and sales in terms of getting out there. We do a lot of demos at the, we, we have a lot of food co-ops in the Twin Cities, so they're owned by the, by the customers. Um, it's kind of food co-op uh, co central here in the U.S. Um, cool. And that's our primary outlet for most of our bread and flour. Um, and so getting in front of those folks and talking about our story and getting them to sample the products and, and that. And of course, ultimately, it's about execution for us. We have to go to mill well and bake well and everything else. But um, if we can't move the needle with that and get market penetration and start to have people view bread you know, they'll spend six, seven, eight dollars for a beer, a micro beer, which that's is great. Right. But it's spend six dollars on a loaf of bread that's gonna last them longer than the 10 minutes or whatever that they take to drink a beer. It's a mindset shift. And you know, you're 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 working up against you're going up the hill. So it's just it takes time, it takes a lot of effort. Um, and being a small business, it, you know, we have to kind of do it through guerrilla marketing, really. So we're not gonna we don't have a budget to yeah airways you know so it's a uh, it's a lot of it's a lot of that but ultimately the the payoff is that hopefully we can begin to move the needle in the direction that i hope it's going but yeah 
I would imagine guerrilla marketing. I, I know that you're that you do have some uh, restaurants where you where you serve bread um, yeah. and, and your, your bread products. So I imagine that's those are one of some of your biggest um, avenues, or they could be, especially if if they listed on the menu. Yes, yeah, that, and then the other one is uh, many of the really higher end restaurants, as far as expensive and, and quality, are they have their own baking programs and. Um, that was a shift that happened for 10 or 15 years ago for various reasons. But anyway, um, they buy, most of those places buy our flour. And so they do list it. So that's a way for us to, again, like you said, make, make it kind of a, pre our presence known in the customer's yeah. mind. But also we've done classes. We do tours. Okay. Oh, cool. uh, before uh, the, the restaurant opened in the building earlier this year that highlights all of our products, uh, including Red Table and Alamar. But before that, we used to do pop-ups, in a sense, in the building, mm -hmm. and have people come in, you know, once a month or every couple of months. And so all of these ways would get people excited about what we were doing, um, but uh, you know, it's, it's just, it just takes time, I think. So we'll, yeah. we'll see. There's also been a lot of good national press about, not necessarily us, but like there's a bakery in New Orleans called Bella Guard, and they, they're doing a very similar thing, you know, they're on flour, they bake, they're more retail focused, more more wholesale focused. It's really the only difference. Um, but they've gotten really great national press. So those type yeah, cool. of really kind of help lift the whole story along in terms of helping people understand where their food comes from. Yeah, absolutely. So um, talking about the building, because you've mentioned it multiple yeah, yeah. times now, and I, yeah. I think it's um, it's a really cool thing because there's um, Kieran who owns the building and is a part owner of Bakersfield and Flour and Bread. Um, and so um, the way that um, we were introduced by Jill uh, Colella, uh, and she, the way she, she mentioned, I, I, I believe is that part of the, and I'm just gonna take the quote from the email that she wrote is that part of the appeal of the food building is that each business has large observation windows where visitors can watch makers, and in this case, you're the maker at work along with various tours slash educational installations that share more detail about each business and its farmer, maker, and purveyor partners. Um, so it sounds like a really interesting place uh, where basically passer, passers-by can come. And how often do people actually come by and just stand there and watch? It's, it's increased significantly since the restaurant opened. Oh, really? Uh, okay. Yeah, so the, there used to be another restaurant that was owned by a different business, um, and then that closed. Anyway, Kieran remodeled the space and it's connected to our building and so people come in and they just wander back throughout the day and now jill is act was brought on a couple of months ago and with her help there's actually been real marketing going on now oh, but i mean that sustained efforts you know and for example she did a tour today i was at work this morning she did a tour um where people came in they paid to be there she gave a very detailed hour and a half tour and then they had lunch and part of it was I had time today, so I had committed to coming out and speaking, you know, monologuing basically like that for 20 minutes. And then I did a sampling with them and talked about what we do and why we do it and then had them try different breads and what they taste like and that. Um, and so those kind of things are, are, are very uh, instrumental in trying to move the ball forward. But yeah, they, they come down and, and they just stare. You know, we're, we're seven days a week and we're kind of in a fishbowl, which is interesting. Red Tables Monday through Friday because they're a United States Department of Agriculture inspected. So anytime you do meat and it travels across state lines, you have to get USDA inspection. Oh, I see. So they're they're based on their hours for inspection, which is Monday through Friday. So they're on the weekends, for example, they're just it's all dark in there. But Alamar's kind of has odd hours because they're always in there turning their cheese or doing it. But mm. so there's there is some some kind of theater to it. Um, but primarily it's us, you know, because we're there, there's somebody there 16 hours a day. So, yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. So we're, you know, it is, it is interesting. It's, it's always funny to see what people, sometimes people just stand there for 20 minutes. Sometimes people look for a minute, you know. But, so you're um, just a goldfish floating. Are goldfish. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it's different. Do people ever tap on the glass? Yeah. Sometimes they'll talk to us. Like we can hear them, you know, like, and they have like, I have no idea what you're saying. <laughs> Yeah, so we have so there's machinery and there's glass. Right, so. exactly. So if we we should put up a little sign like "Don't feed the animals," "Don't feed the baker," or something like that. Um, but yeah, but it's it is a it's an interesting model. As far as I know, the restaurant is the only functioning restaurant in a food production space. 
Mm. So the way the building is constructed, the three businesses that are producing food are um, kind of the kind of the anchors really, and then the restaurant is is part of the building. But because you can go and wander through the hallways, and it's also an event space, so oh. that gets shut down periodically when there's an event. Um, you know, it's it's a little bit different that way, um, and it it's still very odd for people, I think, to be able to wander. It, it's it's an interesting and new thing where. We think there's a food review coming out for the restaurant in two days, which could be really great for them. I think it's going to be pretty positive. So yeah. that'll help bring more people into the building. That's really cool. And do you provide any products to the restaurant? Yeah, everything. Uh, all the breads, all the flour, all the pe- oh, everything. Awesome. Yeah, they, they are making some pasta and crackers with the flour we're giving them. But for the most part, any of the bread that they use for like for soup or sandwiches yeah. or uh, you know, the, the breakfast pastries and all of that type of stuff we're making. Yeah. So. But by the way, speaking of um, guerrilla marketing and crackers, um, have, you, have you ever considered working with the, I, I missed the name, but the, the cheese guys? Oh, Alamar, yeah. Alamar, yeah, maybe like a, a cheese and cracker basket? That yeah, yeah, at some point. Um, you know, crackers are hard, at least from, we're pretty small. Like there are 11 of us. Um, in order to make money at crackers, it's about volume. Yeah. <laughs> and, got to be able to produce a lot and in order to do that and package it and all of that we'd have to have kind of know that we've got a market for it and we just haven't haven't worked on that i would say that that's at the back end of this year potentially okay that's cool right now we're really working on ben Wasserie, which is like laminated doughs croissants and danish and things like that's that cool. um all naturally leavened um and so uh we, we don't use any commercial use for example so we're in the R and D stage on that, trying to figure it out how to use it with our flour. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit more challenging because of the fact of, of, of the fact that our flour has a lot more ash content to it. But um, anyway, then I'll tell you all of that. But yeah, we're working on that. So naturally leaven, that was something I wanted to to ask about. And you, you you just mentioned it. What what is that? What how is yeah. that? So people think of the word sourdough, right? Okay. And yeah. I try not to use the word sourdough very much, except in the explanation as an as a starting point because most people that I talk to in this market, when I say sourdough, they think of something very specific. Yeah. San Francisco sour, right? It's exactly. A lot of food. But that is it, it's very limited because you can make a wide range of products with naturally leavened process. And I say naturally leavened or naturally fermented because that's using the wild yeast and bacteria that are available on the grain and in the flour um, and on you and in the air. Um, and so you can make something mild. You can make something very sharp and acidic, uh, acetic acid type. Uh, you can make a lighter loaf, a denser loaf. There's a wide variation. Um, and so that's why I'll start there because people are like, what's that, Ashley Lemon? So that's a way to have them ask a question, hopefully, or look confused, and then I answer. Yeah. Explain. Um, and so we can make something that has a really open crumb structure, for example, like a regular holes, or make something very, very dense, like 100% rye. Um, it just depends on the cultures we use, the flour we use, the process, the whole thing. So. That's kind of our, our approach, yeah. So what's so. what would unnaturally leavened? Well, so that's commercial yeast. It's not unnatural, it's just commercial yeast. So yeast that's been manufactured. So the, the difference is, is that natural leavening or, or natural fermentation takes a longer uh, amount of time to achieve a similar result. And, and it is different anyway because of the bacteria element to it. But commercial yeast, works much, much faster because it's a higher concentration of a leavening agent. Um, they're not even really the same thing. A lot of people say they're cousins, very distant cousins. Mm. The same so, thing with so do you even, do you use yeast? Just the natural wild yeast that is kind of works symbiotically with the bacteria that exists in the pH. Oh, wow. Room. And you, it, that's, you have enough control in terms of being able to... You do, but the key to the sourdough natural leavening process really is your your culture maintenance. So people call it culture, chef, mother, all these different uh, words. Yeah, yeah. We call it our starter, and then when we put the final starter into a dough, we call it our lavan. It's just for simplicity, that's our nomenclature, but basically they're all the same kind of ideas. But what is starter maintenance? So we feed our cultures twice a day, every day. Um, we feed them with the same flowers, and we, we hit a very specific temperature range. So oh, those element, we keep them at room temperature as well. So keeping all of those parameters, you know, keeping them very closely uh, um, kind of dialed in and then documenting all of that information. So if there is a mistake or a problem, we can try to address that. Those are the keys to making sure that you get consistent results. Yeah. In addition to how you mix and, you know, all those other things, hmm. can, of course, is the most important. But yeah, 
So those are those are the keys to that. But um, we have three primary cultures that we have that we maintain all the time. We have a rye, we have a whole, whole weed, and then we have a one that's a liquid that's a red flower. Um, and then from there, we'll we'll spring out in the afternoon, and from those three, make eight different levons that we'll use for the next day in the morning. So oh, next I see. And so then you just take a piece of those and elaborate it into another. So it's this constant elaboration that goes on. Wow. It's a, it's a living, living organism. It's definitely a living organism. Yeah. You're on the bread, uh, you're on the dough's life, really. You know, you're, yeah. you're following its cycle. So you control that to a degree, but yeah. you, know, you, you try to you try to control it as much as you can. But there are factors that, that are always out of our uh, control like when it is really really cold here no matter how we keep our main room 75 degrees at all times as much as we can but it definitely makes a difference when it's 15 below outside you know that is still going to have an effect on things yeah, wow so. that's incredible what what's um what's your favorite bread that you make oh it varies from time to time right now i've had a we make a 100 percent whole wheat bread called complete is mm -hmm. the name of it. and i've been um I've been really enjoying that bread. We started using a sprouted grain um, for that particular bread. One of our farmers grows a hard bread spring wheat called Ingmar, and he took a, a large percent, a portion of what he had and sprouted it. I have somebody else, a company that does this, a malting company, they sprouted it. So what that means is they, they, they soak, the, soak the grain and then they germinate it. Okay. Uh, and then um, once it starts to germinate at a stage, they, they, they drain it and they heat it to a point where it stops the germination. So it's sprouted. So in other words, more of the nutrients and sugars are available. Um, and we, um, we have uh, some of that grain available. We're using that in this, this particular bread. It's the only bread we use it in. Um, and I really like the flavor profile that it gives it. And it gives it a whole nother level of, of acidity, but also sweetness at the same time, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. And it's always a challenge for us in terms of just getting that bread just right. But anyway, I, oh, that's kind of interesting. I'm starting to get hungry. That sounds yeah, amazing. Yeah. Nothing, um, nothing beats really good bread with just some butter. That's that's generally what most people, yeah, that's what they, like, they have to say. Yeah. It's so simple and yet just so satisfying. It's so good. Right, right. And that's hopefully what you can dial into you know, in terms of you know really trying to bring out that what people's memory sensory memories are yeah. their their family or whatever it happens to be uh, you know we i don't know if this happened in the uk but we had a, for about 20 years i would say there's been this gluten free slash atkins push and yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the atkins thing is for the most part is is been tempered but gluten free is still very much real and and for for good reasons but it has had an effect on bread in terms of mm being demonized or you know uh, uh in, in the consumption as well just overall consumption is down on bread so i was actually gonna ask um yeah. sorry can you say that again oh i always tell people eat more eat more grains eat yeah. more flour than your bread it just depends on what kind of grains of flour you know in terms of what your your, your body can take yeah. i never tell you, know, you can't eat that or you can't eat this you have to figure out what works for you but Whole grains are a great way for your for your digestive system to work better. I was I was wondering that in in terms of the way that you know in terms of your product and the grain that you're using, is there um have you ever heard anyone say actually you know I normally can't eat bread but this one is okay? Does it? Really... Yeah, we get so we do a farmers market um, here and um, it's called Mill City's Farmers Market um, downtown. And we get that quite a bit every week. Somebody will say that to uh, to our front, front end people. You know, we 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 I can't eat bread normally, but I can eat this. And a lot of that is uh, we want, we can go down that road if you want modern heritage ancient grains. But a lot of it I think has to do with more with fermentation. You know, in terms of the longer the fermentation process, the more enzymatic activity, the more the breakdown of uh, I see. a lot of grains and starches. So that that most likely is what's making it more digestible. I can't say for sure. The University of Minnesota has actually started a study this past year. They're trying to, uh, they're taking in, I believe it's, it's over, well over a hundred samples of different grain, uh, wheat, um, be it ancient, modern, or heritage. And they're trying to map out the genetic codes for these grains. And then they want to do a comparison because a lot of the anecdotal information is that modern wheat is causing a lot of the gluten insensitivity or slash celiac problems. 
versus heritage or ancient cranes. Interesting. And they don't really have a position on that, but they need, in order to even dive into it, they need to have a basis of information. So they're they're looking at doing this fairly comprehensive study, which I think is still going to take another year for them to get all of that material figured out. Um, and then I don't know where they start. But their initial theory, at least some of the people that I've talked to there, um, is that it's not the proteins, which is what most people think it is. Yeah, yeah. It's the starch levels because a lot of modern meats are able to have a higher percentage of starch versus the her heritage. Wow. But that would be it, really interesting. We'll see what happens with yeah. it. At the end of the day, it's what you can eat. You know, yeah. I say everybody, everybody's uh, different. 90% of the U.S. population can still eat meat. 10% of the population is either celiac, gluten insensitive, or gluten allergic. So um, it still means the majority of people here can eat wheat. It's just a matter of uh, figuring out what works for you. Yeah. I think it's important. Just, you know, your body. So right, exactly. there's no one else who can really I tell you. Say, like, oh yeah. you can eat this. I'm like, try it if you want. It yeah. works great. If it doesn't, I'm sorry, you know, uh, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, so um, as, as we start to wrap up here, um, yeah one of the questions I always like to ask is um, what are some of the things that, that you do in addition to supporting uh, regenerative farmers on a daily basis um, that are environmentally sustainable, something that maybe can inspire some of our listeners to uh, perhaps take action in their, in their own lives to be a little sure. bit more sustainable. Yeah. I mean, I, I think for me, it's, um, it's a lot to do with personal choices. Uh, and because we have, uh, I, I think a somewhat unique grocery landscape. Um, we have our traditional grocery stores, we have our Gucci slash boutique grocery stores, but we also have the food co-ops, which tend to be much more focused on organic and local than the conventional grocery stores are. Um, they don't just have a section of it, it's most of their products. And so I, I make a commitment to shop there as much as I can um, for most of the products that I buy. Um, because I know that most of those dollars are going back to um, not only the company or the organization that is the co-op, but also in, in most cases to farmers who are uh, selling their, their products for a, a higher price than the yeah. more, more conventional uh, system. So that would, I would say, probably be the biggest thing. Um, you know, I, I, <laughs> I try to, I just try to be a good steward of everything, but I'm sure that I, I being a child of the 60s and 70s and a lot of women and than you may think, um, uh, maybe not, uh, but um, I, I have bad habits that I try to break. But, you know, so. I think, yeah, doing a little bit, a little bit is better than trying to be perfect and failing and then not doing anything at all. Right, exactly, and then being stressed about it or feeling guilty. Um, exactly. you know, I, I, I think it, it has a lot to do with, yeah, the personal choices you make on a daily basis, you know, in terms Absolutely. of really, um, you know, globally, I think how you how you hopefully engage with the world in terms of politics and uh, um, how decisions are made on a, that affect everybody. So, yeah, you know, farm bill, for example, here you're having dialogue. I don't know how it works in the UK, but you can call. I'm sure there too. You can call your representatives here and discuss things that you're concerned about, and um, they may or may not listen. But at least you've made the effort. You know. So, yeah, exactly. So. That's I think good advice. Not definitely remember that we individuals can make an impact and, and can, as you're, as you've been saying, move the needle and, and, um, you know, basically inform, uh, not only the government, but also just producers and makers on what it is that, that we value. Um, you know, yeah, absolutely. people who purchase from you, they're, they're not purchasing from a big bread manufacturer and that's telling, you know, that's supply and demand. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that's, you know, we, what would I would, I would love to see in this market is for four or five more businesses that are very similar to us, yet the same, you know, maybe they're the same scope or different scope, smaller, larger, do the exact same thing, like mill, source, source, mill, and, yeah. and with uh, ingredients that they're, they're, they're getting from around this area. Um, that would be, that would be fantastic. That would mean maybe we're starting to, to make a difference, in the, at least in this market. You know? Yeah. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's kind of where I, uh, that's part of the motivation of what we're doing. So. 
Well, best of luck. And for the people who are interested in trying some of the delicious breads that you've, uh, and other products that you've been talking about, um, how can people find you and where can they learn about more? Where can they learn more about your work? Yeah, mainly I'd say it's our website or uh, we have a lot of links to some of the media that we've had. Uh, mm -hmm. But coming back to like even sustainability, we're really regionally focused. By regional, I mean the Twin Cities metro area. Every now and then we'll have people that say, oh, can you ship us bread? I said, again, it's going to be very expensive. It's not yeah. really Go to find a local baker and support them. Um, but uh, generally, we're, we're looking at the Twin Cities, seven county metro areas, our market, primarily the two urban cities that we have in St. Paul. But I would say our website, uh, certainly coming to the building, and getting a tour, you know, signing up for classes, those type of things. That's the best way to engage us right now. Um, you know, I, hopefully we can continue to do more. Yeah, sounds like it's worth worth a visit. Uh, yeah, it's a, a really it's a, unique place. I mean, Mike's room. Uh, they have these aging rooms that you can see. They're they're salamis, small and large caliber. Oh, wow. People hanging, you know, it's it's a it's visually very compelling. You know, yeah. you see the salami just hanging there. There's these huge vats of milk turning you know and uh is for Alamar. yeah it's, it's an interesting space wow cool and um you said it's it's all primarily local but for the people who are interested in tasting your bread i think probably the best thing to do is just stop by the food building oh, fly in fly in visit yeah. us i'm now with the tourism department of minnesota so come on i'm just kidding uh come on in <laughs> i'm sure they'd love that actually so yeah, it sounds like fun. Well, Steve, thank you very much for your time and for um, for all the work you're doing. I think it's I think it's really important to support local. Thank you very much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed it, give us a five star rating, and also please subscribe, whether on your podcast app or on YouTube, and that way you can be the first to know about new episodes. Thank you very much, and talk to you soon. <laughs>